Gaude amus omnes in domino. I am going in the way of the fathers, for I see myself being summoned by the Lord. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina, and today we continue our discussion of the great apologists of early Christianity. They practiced apologetics, the art of explaining and defending the faith. They wanted to correct the misinformed, but more than that, they also hoped to convert the misinformed. They followed the example set by St. Paul as he spoke before King Agrippa and the Roman governor Festus. In Acts chapter 26, Paul refutes the false accusations brought against him, but he also appeals to the minds and hearts of his judges. To King Agrippa, Paul argued from the prophets of Israel. To Festus Portius, Paul made his case from Roman law. Paul was transparent about his motives. Agrippa said to him, in a short time you think to make me a Christian. And Paul responded, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day, might become such as I am, except for these chains. Paul did not hesitate to approach the mighty men of his days, for his own sake, for self-defense, but also for their sake, that they might be saved and the world won for Jesus Christ. Paul dared to imagine his rulers transformed by the gospel. The early Greek apologists wished and worked toward the same end. Aristides of Athens addressed an apology to the emperor Hadrian. Athenagoras, another apologist from Athens, directed his pleas to the emperors Marcus Aurelius and Commodus. Melito of Sardis also addressed an apology to Marcus Aurelius. But by far the greatest of the early apologists was Justin of Flavia Neapolis in Palestine. And, spoiler alert, We know him today as St. Justin Martyr, which kind of gives away the ending of his story. Justin was born around 100 AD in the biblical region of Samaria. His parents were probably Greek colonists settled there by Roman authorities in the wake of the first Jewish rebellion. They were Gentiles and worshippers of the traditional gods. Justin was what we today call a seeker. He had the metaphysical itch and he was drawn by a strong magnetic pull toward the study of philosophy. At first, he enrolled with a teacher from the Stoic school, but he found the Stoics cared little about divinity and religious questions, so he moved on to the school of Aristotle. The teacher there seemed primarily concerned about money and was eager to collect Justin's tuition fees. This made Justin uneasy about the man's motives, so our hero sought out a teacher from the Pythagorean school. This man informed him that before he could study philosophy, Justin would first have to master music, astronomy, and geometry. For this, Justin had no patience, and so, once again, he moved along. It was then that he found a Platonist, a disciple of the school of Plato. With that man, Justin finally felt that he was making progress. In Plato, he encountered the realm of the immaterial and spiritual, the heaven of forms, and also a clearer notion of God as the supreme being. Then one day, walking along the seashore, he encountered an old man who turned his attention away from the Greek philosophers and toward the prophets of Israel. The prophets, he said, lived long before Plato and Aristotle, and they saw and announced the truth. They did not speculate by the fallible powers of reason as the philosophers did, Rather, they spoke by the power of the Holy Spirit. Their oracles were confirmed quite recently, and not far from Justin's birthplace, in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. The old man noted that the writings of the prophets were still available for study, and Justin could confirm their truth for himself. Justin was familiar with Christianity because it was often the subject of gossip. He had grown up hearing the Christians were vicious and pleasure-loving. But then he had seen Christians go forward courageously to their death as martyrs. They seemed to fear no earthly power. The testimony of the martyrs had made an impression on him. 
And now the words of this mysterious old man seem to explain the source of the martyr's fortitude. The unnamed old man opened Justin's mind and changed it. Justin took up the study of Christianity and soon decided that this Christian philosophy alone was sure and reliable. The seeker found what he'd long been looking for. He found truth, meaning, answers, explanations. From that moment forward, he considered himself a philosopher and began to wear the pallium, the rectangular cloak that was the traditional garb of a philosopher. Now, this was a subversive act. It was provocative. By declaring himself a philosopher, Justin was issuing a direct challenge to the intellectuals of his time and place. The educated classes in 130 AD considered Christianity not a philosophy, but rather a superstition. A superstition could be dismissed with a laugh or a wave of the hand, but a philosophy offered arguments. A philosophy demanded a response. He became an itinerant teacher, wandering from place to place, living from the tuition of his students. He crossed continents this way, traveling more than a thousand miles from his native Palestine and settling for a time in the Greek city of Ephesus on the Aegean Sea. Even at this early date, Ephesus was already home to vibrant communities of Christians and Jews. The church there had been founded by St. Paul, and St. Timothy was its first bishop. According to tradition, St. John had lived there and cared for the Virgin Mary in her final years. When Justin arrived, it was still near the dawn of Christianity, and it was bliss in that dawn to be alive in that place. He took an active part in the city's intellectual life, engaging in public debates and forging friendships with all sorts of people. But he didn't stay there. And we know about his time in Ephesus mostly because he wrote about it later, when he reached his final destination. Justin's trajectory, like that of Peter and Paul and so many of the church fathers, was Romeward. He made it to the empire's capital when Antoninus Pius was the emperor, between 138 and 161. Now this was the big time. As a philosopher in Rome, Justin would have a chance to exercise a far greater influence. He established a school of philosophy there, and he succeeded in drawing students, bright students. This probably roused the envy of competing schools. He disputed publicly with a cynic philosopher named Crescens, and must have bested him, because rather than defeat Justin by argument, Crescens denounced him as a Christian. At the time, the mere profession of Christian faith was an illegal act. Christians were considered to be atheists because they refused to offer sacrifices to the traditional gods of Rome. There were rumors abroad, too, that Christians practiced cannibalism, eating the flesh of the Son of Man, and participated in freewheeling debauchery behind closed doors. The magistrates were disinclined to hear the Christian side of the story, so believers were often summarily sentenced without a full trial. But Justin's day-to-day -day work in philosophy won him a reputation as a trusted teacher, a reasonable and just man with an open mind. And he used this platform to present first the case for Christians, and then the case for Christ. Justin wrote two apologies, one to the Emperor Antoninus, and the other to the Roman Senate. And in them, he tried to dispel the rumors and urban legends about Christianity. He did this by flatly denying their substance, but also by overcoming the falsehoods with facts. Christians had been reluctant to disclose the secrets about their worship, out of reverence, out of awe, and from the strong suspicion that the Romans would only respond with mockery, they kept silent when asked about the liturgy. But not Justin. Since the Romans were spreading wild rumors about what happened behind closed doors, he flung the doors wide open. He wanted to dispel prejudices with the evidence of facts. In his apologies, he, he included detailed descriptions of the rituals involved in baptism and Eucharist. He also spelled out the doctrine of both sacraments, the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, the deification of the believer in baptism. Justin's account of the Mass is so complete that it was incorporated verbatim in the section on the Eucharist in the 1992 Catechism of the Catholic Church.
But Justin didn't simply give the pagan Romans a catechism lesson. He tried first to build them a bridge. He spoke to them in terms they understood from their own great philosophers. He said, There seem to be seeds of truth among all men. But he pointed out that fallible human beings do not accurately interpret these seeds of truth. He believed, for example, that Socrates was empowered by Christ to deconstruct the gods of ancient Greece. So Justin felt free to consider Socrates and Plato as authorities, as collaborators in the truth, and even, in an extended sense, as co-religionists. They just needed a little correction. He felt free to invoke Socrates and Plato when he was arguing against the Platonists of his day, and he continued to employ the dialectical method he had learned as a Platonist. Listen to just a bit of Justin's second apology. Quote, I both boast and with all my strength strive to be found a Christian, not because the teachings of Plato are different from those of Christ, but because they are not in all respects similar as neither are those of the others, the Stoics, and poets, and historians. For each man spoke well in proportion to the share he had of the seeds of the word, seeing what was related to it. But they who contradict themselves on the more important points appear not to have possessed the heavenly wisdom, and the knowledge which cannot be spoken against. Whatever things were rightly said among all men are the property of us Christians." Justin practiced a liberality that was well beyond the reach of his opponents. He discerned one truth that was unitary and whole, and so wherever he found truth, he was quick to acknowledge it and claim it. As a Christian, he could say whatever things are rightly said are ours. Whatever is good is ours. Justin also professed an honest respect for the traditions of Roman law. In fact, he condemned the Romans' current treatment of Christians as inconsistent with their own principles. He noted that the courts were accepting a low standard of evidence for accusations against Christians. He noted also that the punishments against Christians seemed grossly disproportionate to the alleged crimes. And finally, he complained that false accusations against Christians were going unpunished. Implicit in Justin's complaint is an idea that would emerge slowly over the next two centuries. It's the idea of religious liberty, which was previously unknown in the world and would be developed in the coming years by other Christian thinkers, most notably Tertullian of Carthage and Lactantius. The Australian scholar Robert Haddad argues persuasively, however, that the notion began with Justin, who presented it to the Romans in terms of their own legal principles. Whatever was good in Roman law, he believed, should be applied to the good of Christians. And Justin was equally concerned with Jews as with pagans. His most extensive surviving work is his 132-chapter Dialogue with Trifo. The dialogue recounts two days of conversation he had when he was young and living in Ephesus, His interlocutor is a rabbi whom some scholars identify with the Trifo or Tarphon mentioned in the Talmud. Justin's dialogue with Trifo is a distilled version of the argument Christians and Jews were having all over the Mediterranean world. What's most interesting here, however, is that it's a friendly argument. Not that Justin doesn't press his points hard, and of course, since he's writing the dialogue, he gets to make some pretty good points. But the whole form of the dialogue presumes that a Christian and a Jew can sit down for quite a long time and argue about their differences without being at each other's throats. And the argument is based on principles they both understand. With the Romans, Justin reasoned from philosophy, the philosophy of Plato and Socrates. But in the dialogue, both he and Trifo argue from the Torah and the prophets of Israel. The subject of the debate is simply this, which group is the true people of Israel's God? Justin ends his dialogue with Trifo and his Jewish friends unconverted, but still friendly. They're happy to have had such a deep discussion of the scriptures, even if they couldn't come to an agreement. At the end, Trifo tells Justin, 
since you are on the eve of departure and expect daily to set sail, do not hesitate to remember us as friends when you are gone. Of course, this was Justin writing down the story, so he could have his characters say whatever he liked. But it's revealing that he chose to leave his Jewish friends unconverted, but well disposed. Again, in Justin, we meet a man whose liberality is prodigious. We meet not merely a philosopher or merely an apologist, but a saint. Justin's nemesis in Rome turned out to be Crescens the Cynic. After his humiliation and argument with Justin, Crescens took up a campaign of disinformation against the Christians. And it seems that he put a spotlight on Justin. Justin responded to Crescens in some detail in his second apology. Justin's response is measured. Justin's studentation was less reserved. Tatian, in his address to the Greeks, exposed Crescens as a pedophile consumed by greed. But Crescens prevailed, and Justin was interrogated before the Roman prefect Rusticus. We have the court transcripts from that proceeding. One last time, Justin was able to make his case. Rusticus was unconvinced and convicted Justin with six of his companions to die by beheading. By then, however, the damage was done. Justin had shown his contemporaries and all subsequent Christian generations how to be fearless in the face of ideas, fearless in the face of power, and fearless even in the face of death. He taught us how to find the good in our adversaries' best ideas and turn it to our own advantage. Whatever is good, he said, belongs to us. Whatever is good is ours. Justin's message was beautiful and true, and it has kept its luster down the millennia. Well, we'd like to bring his message and the message of all the fathers to more and more people in our own time. So please consider making a donation to keep these podcasts going. Our sponsor, CatholicCulture.org, is run by Trinity Communications, a nonprofit organization. So donations are tax deductible in the United States. Donations can be made by credit card, PayPal, check, or in the form of stock. So please go now to our donation form at CatholicCulture.org slash donate slash audio. We pray for our benefactors every day. I thank you for listening. De quorum solemnitate gaudentan geli et collaudant Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman, and for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, listen to the Catholic Culture podcast.